I just got really good at getting results for clients, both physically um, and then also business-wise. Then one thing led to another and I started coaching coaches and teaching them how I was running my business. And we now run the world's largest organization to build fitness businesses. And what does a successful online fitness business even look like? Well, they've got three things. They've got a really bold, strong character. They've got a big cause that's bigger than themselves. They want to change the world and deal with the problems in the world. And they're really committed to it. The reality is you've got an ethical and moral responsibility to make money in your business. Otherwise, you can't help anyone. And the only reason why you wouldn't want to sell to somebody is because you don't want to hear the word no and because you're too soft. AI isn't going to take your business, but a business using AI will take your business because it will be able to do things faster, more economically, and cheaper. You commonly hear uh, entrepreneurs that are in their startup phase moaning and yapping about, I've got no friends, nobody relates to me, and I feel like I'm alone. Well, no shit, Sherlock, because your old friends aren't interested in what you're fucking doing. And the new people that you're trying to get in with, you can't add any value there because you've got no battle scars or actually proof that you can do what you say you're gonna do. The problem with a lot of people is that they focus on building a personal brand before they've built a business that actually provides cash, stability, safety. So my number one piece of advice would be Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video and subscribe to our channel. Today's guest is a world-renowned fitness entrepreneur mentor, Phil Graham. Phil, welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. How are you? I'm good. Paul, Danny, thank you so much for having me on. I know how much time it takes to organize these and clip them up and put them together. So uh, I appreciate the invite. I'm ready to share as much gems of wisdom as I can and value and insight for your audience. Well, we appreciate the time. You know, you're a very busy man. Um, so I wanted just to ask, first of all, just thinking uh, about, I guess, the fitness industry. Over the next sort of three to five years, what do you think that's going to look like? Well, we've seen a massive increase in the amount of AI at the moment. And a lot of coaches are worrying about, is that going to take my career? Is that going to take the ability for me to prescribe training information, dietary information, all of this kind of stuff? And the answer is, AI isn't going to take your business, but a business using AI will take your business because it will be able to do things faster, more economically, and cheaper. One of the biggest things that's going to differentiate any business that's in the service-based world from AI is community and being part of a movement, being part of a mission, being part of a room of individuals that have got like-minded goals, cause challenges, and they can collaborate and gel together. So really making sure that if you want to de-risk yourself from AI is that one, you're starting to incorporate it. You learn what it is. You learn how you can use it. And two, you're building a community that people want to be a part of. And I'd probably say point three would be to look at building a personal brand because people will relate to your style before they relate to the actual services and solutions that you provide. And if you can bring a unique style that's authentically rebellious, that essentially is your own backstory, your own style, the way that you show up, people are really going to resonate with that. And what I can actually see with AI, with it being such a popular topic, is I can actually see people becoming very sophisticated and untrustworthy of information. And, you know, there's a, a great friend of mine that puts at the bottom of his email, P.S., this email was written by a 100% human. It wasn't written by a machine. It wasn't written by ChatGPT. It was written by me. And, you know, I have thoughts on AI and the future of AI and how I feel it's going to essentially go. But that would be a big, big thing is that you're going to see more of that. Uh, number two, like any industry, there's going to be people that are going to quit. There's going to be people that are going to start. The cream always rises to the top. And, you know, as a business owner, the number one question you need to ask yourself is, how can I be more relevant than every other option in the marketplace? And like anything else, if you carry on doing the same thing and you don't move with the times and you don't make your messaging and you don't make your service relevant, then you're going to be made obsolete. And being made obsolete, well, you'll soon be able to measure that in the leads that you generate, the demand that you have for your business, and the conversion rate, and ultimately the bottom line. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, a, a couple of other points on that too. I only see obesity getting worse. 
you know, we're getting smarter with food marketing. We're getting smarter with alcohol marketing. Um, we're also getting lazier. So, you know, I talked about AI. Well, you think if AI is going to do a task for you far more effectively and quicker, and you're not going to have to think and you get to preserve your energy, but food is so much more calorific, more available, accessible, et cetera, then the, you know, the issue of obesity is grounded around people are less active. You know, if you went back in the day and people were eating flipping lard, bacon, fat, steak, fat, it's because there were like, you know, carton potatoes up the hill, right? <laughs> so, you know, now you go into, I always use the example of a supermarket. You go in and there's no cashier. It's all like self-service. Think of how many calories that cashier would have been burning if they were there nine to five versus now sitting looking for another job. So there's all these factors that are feeding obesity. And well, you know, obesity and metabolic conditions are the number one driver of ill health and death. So, you know, fitness industry is only going to be growing and creating more opportunity. And I also think as well, the personal development and coaching space is also going to be continuing to grow. Because, like, you know, social media, it's hard to know what to believe now. You go on social media, you go off it, you don't feel great. Why? Because you're looking at a highlight reel of people that have perfectly created their life in a way that essentially is making a lot of people feel inferior or live up to a standard that they can't afford in order to fit in and feel normal because nobody wants to feel excluded. Nobody wants to feel like they're not good enough. And it's just a very hard, it's a distorted reality. And we're surrounded by symbols of that. You know, my social media usage is very, I'm very strict with it. And, you know, one question that everybody listening to this right now should be asking, uh, am I creating or am I consuming right now? Cre if you want to, if you want to get wealthy, you want to be successful and you want to grow, you create more than you consume. You consume whenever you've hit certain points in your day. So I have rules. I will only consume social media whenever I have hit certain things in my day. Have I ticked off X? Have I ticked off Y? X, Y, and Z? Critical, you know? So um, those are important. Yeah, no, some really good points there, mate. And, and, and just in regard to, I guess, thinking about that integrated AI type fitness delivery that you mentioned at the, the very start there, I think a lot of PTs are still obviously stuck in the gym space. And you could argue that the more experienced, slightly older PTs um, are maybe less in tune with social media. So what would your advice be to, to those PTs in the gym space exchanging their time for money in regard to how they transition out of that and maybe go online and start utilizing the AI? Well, look, not everybody is going to want to run an online business. Some of those old school personal trainers are perfectly happy collecting a bit of cash, speaking to clients on the daily, and just having a really comfortable income. Personal training is a very well-paid career. So I always say being an online coach is significantly harder than a personal trainer. Why? The number one reason is you're marketing to the world, not the people that are coming into the four walls of the gym. When people are coming into the gym, they can see the personal trainer, see their clients, see the transformation. Whenever I was a personal trainer, I did really well because my clients always looked different. I did really well because I always was in uniform, always wearing a clipboard, always like, like I knew the eyeballs were on me and I wanted people to see me taking my role seriously. I wanted people to see me, you know, just really provide an incredible service. And, um, you know, that's harder to do online because you're then into the, you know, you can use social media, but you're then against the mercy of algorithms that want you to pay to play. And if you don't know how to use paid advertising, you don't know how to set up funnels, you know, you got to have money to make money. So use your personal training career to make money, use that money to then buy the skills that you need to navigate the digital landscape and then use that money that you have to drive advertising and exposure and distribution pay to get in front of audiences out of the pain point that you solve. Whatever business that you're in, if you want to get more customers, get in front of the audiences that have the pain point that you solve. Make a mission every single month. How many people am I getting in front of? How many radio interviews, podcast interviews, uh, TV shows, public speaking gigs? You know, that's the, that's the one thing that really grew my career was getting on stages and, and really focusing on 
moving from one to one to one to many leverage. So, you know, I could, I'm speaking to you guys now, but this is going out to thousands of people. So it's leverageable. If I was to just have a conversation with you, Paul, on a one-to-one call, it's not going to go beyond the call, despite the fact that we could share a ton of amazing stuff. It's just going to end there, you know? So think about one-to-many in every aspect of your life, especially if you're a business owner. How can I take what I'm doing right now from one-to-one and apply it to -to one-to-many because it's going to develop you as a business owner and it's going to help more people? That's great. That's great information, isn't it? I never really thought of it like that. Getting in front of people, doing podcasts. Obviously, we do a podcast, but I mean, as in pushing yourself out there to do other podcasts to then grow. How did how did you go about initially doing that though? Because obviously, ask. people's barrier to that is not being known. Did you just literally ask and and say, you know, did did you? Let want me give you guys an podcast? important life lesson. You show what you're committed to in life by asking for what you want, and the degree of what you ask for what you want resembles the degree of belief that you have in your ability to get it. So it all boils down to what do I want from my life? What are the activities and the behaviors that are going to allow me to achieve that? And who can I ask? You know, people don't ask because they're worried about somebody saying no. They're worried about failing. And the reality is that's just a fucking delusion in their head, right? What's the worst thing you're going to get a no? Okay, cool. Go to somebody else and focus on becoming that good and this is an important part about, I'm kind of going off on a bit of a tangent here, no, but like it. the important thing about mastery and developing an incredible network of people around you is to be comfortable having a vision that's bigger than yourself and to commit to that vision and know that initially it's going to be lonely, but happiness is an inside job, right? Happiness is an internal job. It's not an external job. So you commonly hear, uh, entrepreneurs that are in their startup phase moaning and yapping about, I've got no friends, nobody relates to me, and I feel like I'm alone. Well, no shit, Sherlock, because your old friends aren't interested in what you're fucking doing. And the new people that you're trying to get in with, you can't add any value there because you've got no battle scars or actually proof that you can do what you say you're going to do. So what you actually need to realize is you need to become your own best friend, realize that all the happiness that you need is actually available to you immediately just with the right questions, and focus on building yourself into the most skilled, most powerful, excellent, masterful individual at what you do. And then you'll have a breakthrough at some point where people start to recognize your work. And then when people start to recognize your work, you then start to communicate with them, liaise with them, build relationships, and they lead to more relationships. And eventually, here's what happens. You go from hanging around with your old school shit friends to then having no friends and dipping and dabbing into like some new people. And then you go full circle and you end up having loads of people that want to objectify from you, like take from you or people that want to hang around with you because you're cool. And then you realize, fuck, this is all too much noise. I just want to be alone <laughs> and you end up back with yourself, right? <laughs> so for all of you guys that are listening to this, that are entrepreneurs that are lonely and complaining and bitching and moaning, find a vision that's bigger than yourself, commit to it and make that your best friend. Yeah, makes sense. And it, it sounds a little bit like you, you've talked about, obviously, sort of projecting a personal brand as well. Do yeah. you feel it's possible to, to, to build a, an online fitness brand that's faceless? So let me talk about personal brand for a moment. Personal brand is going to be related to your backstory, the chaos that you've had in your life, the wins that you've had, and the adversity that you've overcome with, and the skills and results that you kind of took from that whole experience. And then if you want, you can turn that into a mechanism that you can sell. Whenever I first started, I went narrow. I went into the fitness world. I went into the diabetic world. And then I was in the fitness world and people started recognizing me as being a really good business owner. And I was really skilled at looking at a business and going, here's what's wrong. Here's what you need to fix. And voila, I got incredible results. But now I've got to a point where I've got an incredible team. I've got an incredible mechanism, incredible system, incredible technology that allows me to deliver an insane amount of value without me needing to be there all the time. And there comes a point in your business where you outgrow your customer. And when you outgrow your customer, you got to play a bigger game. you got to play things that are going to challenge you and stimulate you in different ways and essentially allow you to evolve. We all want to evolve. Paul wants to evolve. Danny wants to evolve. And we only can evolve when we try new things and go after new relationships and, and new missions in life. So 
The problem with a lot of people is that they focus on building a personal brand before they've built a business that actually provides cash, stability, safety. So my number one piece of advice would be go narrow first, get really, really good, build an asset that cash flows. And then whenever you build the asset that cash flows, that's kind of like your trophy. That's the entry card to the personal brand world. Interesting. I would have thought, as I imagine many do, it's the other way around. Well, unless you want to build something that is entirely dependent upon you from the start, yeah. it's wiser to create something that relies on a team and a series of systems to spit out cash flows so that you can then go and fund your personal brand and do things with it. Um, a lot of people are, are more concerned with being popular on Instagram than they are with actually making profit in their business. You know, If you want to sleep in your bed at night, make profit. Yeah, good advice. Yeah, no, that's good, mate. Thank you. And I guess this is a fairly relative question, but in your opinion, what does a successful online fitness business even look like? Well, they've got three things. They've got a really bold, strong character. They've got a big cause that's bigger than themselves. They want to change the world and deal with the problems in the world. And they're really committed to it. They're not afraid of making money. They know that in order to grow and help more people, they need to make money. Their marketing is distinctive. It's authentically rebellious. It's got a unique style to it, a unique twist to it, something that people can't keep get enough of. And it teaches, it educates, it inspires, but also provides a high level of social proof. They've got a strong sales mechanism. They start conversations regularly, and they make offers every single day to people that they know that they can help. And then they've got a delivery process that just is engineered to get results faster than competitors. So when you combine all of that together and run it like a, a, a well-oiled machine, it can grow and scale to whatever limits are in the imagination of the finder. So yeah, so cause, keep, uh, what do we say? Character, cause, commitment, vision, and uh, all of that stuff together. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. I can read my own hand right in there. That's what happened, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I, th I feel like some of that stuff, like uh, I, I know a lot of really good PTs, Yep. Um, they've got great character. They, they, they're really passionate about their cause and they're, they're definitely committed. Yep. But it's that business stuff, the, the, the efficiencies, building that team, all the stuff that you just talked about towards the back end where they just fall down. I mean, where, yeah. where do you even begin to learn that type of stuff? Yeah, 100%. I mean, normally people that have got a great skill set, hobby or interest aren't necessarily great business people. So whenever you become a business owner, you take on a lot of responsibility and that responsibility is geared around marketing, understanding copywriting, language, persuasion, influence. Then you're into sales, you're into pricing, offer mechanics, ability to persuade, influence, handle objections. Um, and then you're into delivery. So understanding what is the result of the client? How do I understand systems and operations? How do I remove myself from the day to day? You know, these are decisions that require risk, rejection, uh, these are decisions that revolve around, you know, hiring people, uh, dealing with personalities, a, a load of things like that, you know. So that those are skills that need to be trained, and you need to go and learn from somebody that's worth modeling, somebody that's done it before, somebody that's got a clear track record that they can help people in those areas. Absolutely. Yeah, that's interesting. Isn't it? I always, I always think of moving on to uh, like on the online side of stuff with like just sales calls and stuff like that. I know that puts a lot of people off transitioning into from like physical to, to online. Well, if you can't sell something that you know is going to change somebody's life, then you don't really believe in it. The reality is you've got an ethical and moral responsibility to make money in your business. Otherwise you can't help anyone. And the only reason why you wouldn't want to sell to somebody is because you don't want to hear the word no. And because you're too soft and the real like reality of this whole thing is is that you are going to get people that are not aligned with you as an individual, not aligned with your process, and essentially don't believe in themselves enough to commit to it. You know, you can't parent everyone. You can't parent all your clients and all your customers. Some people are happy as they are, and they don't want help. And you projecting what you feel people need can sometimes stress you out and stress those people out. So if you're really clear on what you do for people, how they can get it and when they can get started. And if you communicate that to the world and humbly brag, be comfortable humbly bragging as to why they should work with you over anybody else, you're going to do well. But if you're worried about hearing the word no and you're worried about you know being rejected, you're never going to grow a business. Business is about constant rejection and being able to handle that and have the resilience and just the tenacity to just 
crank on, you know? All right. We, we've say we've got to that point. So we've, we're, we're now online. We've, we've got, we're turning over a small profit, but we want to scale. How, how do I go about that? Look at the places where you're spending time where you shouldn't be. And for a personal trainer that gets the 10K per month online, the number place, the number one place where they're wasting time is usually doing graphic design, video editing, uploading posts. The second place is with their clients when they're doing check-ins and a lot of one-to-one delivery. The third place is in the sales process where they're starting conversations and having chats and doing DMs all the time. And the fourth place is sales calls. So if you can replace somebody to do your graphic design, your video editing, your content production and upload it for you, then replace somebody to do your sales conversations and chats and inquiries, then replace somebody that does your coaching and your fulfillment and helps you deliver on the results that you promised people when they signed up, and also somebody to do your sales calls, you're going to be cranking a very great business. And it gives you capacity and time and energy to go and focus on the areas that you should be focusing on. Yeah, again, I, I feel like that's potentially an area of, of challenge for some PTs because they're probably control freaks. So they wanna hang on to everything and be in the detail. Yep. And I think it's, it's having that trust in the people around you to, I guess, deliver a service to the standards that you have previously. Yep. And how would you advise people to overcome that barrier? Well, there's a couple of beliefs that you need to shatter. One, there are people out there that can do things better than you. And to think otherwise is really selfish and really insecure and incredibly blindsided. The fact of the matter is you have an, a finite amount of energy and time. And essentially, your whole business is dependent upon you. And if you're really on a mission to change as many lives as possible, but you're not hiring or not building the systems you're never going to achieve that. So in order for you to achieve that, it's important that you step into true leadership and actually learn how to do for the first time, just like anything's going to be uncomfortable, how to find the right people, how to hire them and train them and teach them. And of course, you could have the fear of, oh, they're going to leave and they're going to take all your clients and whatever. Hold on to that belief and see how that serves you. It doesn't work out that well. If you trust in your ability to know your subject, know how to get results and know how to rock and roll, you should never be afraid of failing or anybody coming and taking your clients. Your real wealth lies in your skill set and your belief in yourself. And that's what you've got to hold on to. So I always say to people, you either do it or you don't. And if you don't do it, who misses out? You, your family, and all the people that you could have served. Simple as that. And the reality is, if you don't do it, Somebody else will, and they'll take your customers. Why? Because they can outperform you because their energy is better, and they've also got people in places that they don't want to be in so they can perform at their best in the areas that essentially you're really weak at. The strength of a business or the strength of a leader in a poorly delegated organization or business becomes its weakness. And then just thinking about, I guess, going back to the AI, AI component, how, how much – you know, should you trust, how much of your business should you trust with, with the team that you've built versus automation and everything else? Because just thinking about maintaining some level of character in your business. Well, I mean, it, it, it really depends on what area from marketing, sales, whatever, but you want to have an element of personalization. You want to have an element of systemization. You want to combine the both to create a superpower. That's the most important thing, because if you're just going to rely on automation, it's going to miss the personal connection. If you just rely on personality and day-to-day kind of charm, then you're going to miss out on predictability. So you need to have a blend of both. Let's just say it's 50-50. Yeah, that's pretty fair, isn't it? Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, and I think, um, and this this may be, um, uh, again, a, a fairly kind of tip of the iceberg type question, but obviously at the moment everyone's aware of the cost of living being through the roof and you speak to any PT these days and that the biggest barrier they get is financial. Do you believe that that's just that the service that's being offered to that individual with that objection is that there's just not enough value being offered or do you think there's a genuine barrier there and how would you deal with that? I think it's a load of bullshit because one, they're focusing on the wrong people. Yep. Uh, Not everybody's skint, not everybody's affected by the cost of living crisis. And there's quite a lot of people that are overweight, out of shape and in pain that have a lot of money. The people that tell you that they can't afford it are telling you on a thousand pound iPhone 
are also the people that are going to flannels and spending 500 quid on a Ballman t-shirt and a pair a 750 quid and a pair of Balenciaga shoes or Gucci bag just to look good on Instagram. They're the same people that are going and spending over 500 quid on a night out when you take into kind of dress, a taxi, tan, Botox, lifts, alcohol, you name it. Um, so in life, when people want something, they normally go out of their way to get it. And no matter really creating that demand and perception that you can give them the thing that they want. So, yeah. Well, what, what do you recommend as a price point then to, to your mentors, mentees? Well, it really depends um, on a number of factors. Number one, it's going to depend on experience and current skill set, both in relation to the coaching ability that you have and also the sales ability that you have. So polar ends of the opposite are if you've got no sales experience and you've got no results, then you're going to have to go a little bit lighter. If you've got a lot of sales experience and you've got a lot of experience, you can go higher. Number two is your track record. Have you done what you say you can do? Have you got enough evidence of it? If I've got one piece of social proof versus 300, I can command the market and ultimately demand. So how, how revved up do you get people? How excited are they to work with you? How you know motivated are they to, to become a client? Um, and that will allow you to control price. And also you got to look at the cost of delivering your services. If you've got a team, if you're hiring out a gym, et cetera, you've got to be profitable. So those factors all come into play. And I always use the very simple question is if you were only to work with one client a year, what would you charge them? And how does that correlate to what you're currently charging right now? Is it more, is it less, or is it the same? If it's less, why? If it's, if it's more, why? So, you know, these are all important things to really take into account, but track record, reputation, demand, messaging, marketing, sales ability are all big, big factors. Yeah, it's pretty sound advice. And, yeah. and Phil, tell us a little bit about the work that you do and uh, the mentorship you provide to, to fitness professionals, mate. Yeah, so long story short, I started whenever I was, you know, it all started for me when I was 16. I got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. I was told that I would go blind, I would lose a limb, I would X, Y, and Z. And I remember after my diagnosis being told that nutrition, training, lifestyle, exercise, all of those things were the, were going to be my savior. And I just became obsessed with learning about the human body, nutrition and everything else. And then I started in the gym. I started training in the most hardcore bodybuilding gym. And one thing led to another and I, you know, I just got really, really interested in nutrition and physical transformation, and I fell in love with it. I remember starting in this bodybuilding gym, and I started at the top of the gym in the recumbent bike and made my way down to the weightlifting area where you can literally smell the trend, right? <laughs> and, uh, I just fell in love with bodybuilding. I fell in love with nutrition, and my dream was to become a dietitian. And long story short, I did really well in bodybuilding. I got noticed for it. Uh, I was studying, people knew I was studying, and people started asking me to do diet programs and training programs. Long story short, I built a really successful personal training business, became more, the, the most in-demand personal trainer in the country at the time, the first online coach in the country. Then I started consulting with gyms, consulting with coaches because they wanted me to teach them all my secrets. And then uh, at the same time, I decided to write an encyclopedia on how to build muscle with diabetes because it just wasn't there. And that amplified my success. And I just got really good at getting results for clients, both physically um, and then also business-wise. Then one thing led to another, and I started coaching coaches and teaching them how I was running my business. And we now run the world's largest organization to build fitness businesses all over the world. And we help them with their vision, their mindset, their marketing, their client acquisition, their sales processes, their customer journey, their delivery, and and building their team and building their wealth. So it's a very exciting journey that's all stemmed from my chaos of being diagnosed with diabetes. And I turned that into uh, a vehicle that allowed me to really impact a lot of people. Yeah, amazing, man. And today, who would you maybe, well, feel free to name the name, but can you give us an example of, uh, I guess, a success story that you've, you've, you've seen as a result of, of the work you've done with somebody? We had a client the other day, just on Christmas Eve. Uh, they sat up and watch their Stripe account go over 1 million for the first time. And, you know, they started with us with a, a, a business that was like at six, seven K a month. And, you know, they hit 112,000 in December. 
and they've now got a team. They're not involved in the day to day, and they're using that money to fuel their business and fuel their lifestyle. And that's a remarkable achievement. You know, that was just a few days ago. Um, so you know that Rob Burkhead and his business partner at the Culture Energy Transformations. Um, we've just off a call there with a girl called Laura Lam. She does you know about 200k a month in her fitness business coaching menopausal women um there's just so many amazing success stories if there's somebody in the fitness industry that you know has hit high six figures seven figures they're either a client or have been a client at some point so uh, we do a lot of meaningful work and we really help them build out the system that allows them to impact public health at scale and also very rich doing it yeah sounds amazing mate Brilliant. And and some of the examples that you just used there are a, a fairly niche. So obviously you with type 1 diabetes, with the menopause, do you feel that the more successful businesses do need that niche or can you be broader and still be successful? Not necessarily, no. It all boils down to the level of character, cause, commitment of the, the CEO and the founder and how big their vision is and their resilience to stress and their ability to just motor on and, and do great work, you know? Amazing. And Phil, where do people find you if they want to reach out, mate? If you go on to Instagram, you can find me, Phil Graham. If you search on Apple uh, Podcasts or Spotify, Phil Graham, Life in Your Terms, or go to phil-graham.com, I'm very easily found. So, yeah. Thank you so much, guys, for for taking the, the time to do this. I know how much time it takes to edit and clip, and I appreciate you taking the time out of your your, your busy days to, to have me on. And I, I hope this has really uh, given some actionable value and insights yeah. and perspective shifting thoughts for your audience so yeah it's been great mate thanks 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 for coming on as well appreciate it cheers mate my pleasure